Good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word today? Heavenly Father, as we come before you on this Sabbath, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided us. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction. As we open your word, we ask for understanding. We need to see that which you would teach us at this time. This time is indeed troublous. There are many things, Father, that we need to understand from your word because they are indeed given to us for examples for this time. Guide us in this end, direct us. For this, Father, we thank you, and in this we pray. Now, and for those that will view this later, in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Okay. Now, give me just a second. Okay. Before you, I believe on the screen, you see a, an Excel spreadsheet, correct? Mm -hmm. And I have blanked out several things on this because we're going to have a test today. But before we have this test, I'm gonna, we're, we're going to look at a couple of passages for our consideration. The, the document that I asked Theodore to send out, we're going to be giving some very tacit references to this, but this is going to be a, a point for our study. And it's going to be something that, that we're going to need to consider. <clears throat> now, as we, as we come to this, I am going to, let's see, I've got to figure out how to open this next one up. Now, do you have a... Uh, a Word document before you? No, nope. you'd have to reshare. You'd have to do a new share. Okay. Okay. okay, new share. How about there? Yep. Okay. Now we're going to look at Signs of the Times, March 7, 1878. There's a purpose to looking at this, and we're going to be considering points as we go through this test today. When the children of Israel left Rephidim, they pursued their journey, winding up a narrow opening through the bold granite rocks of the desert mountains. They gradually ascended higher and higher until there opened before them a wide extended plain enclosed by granite ridges and mountain peaks towering through the heavens. Horeb's range stood before them in somber majesty. The rocky crags towering aloft directed the eyes to the travelers of the travelers heavenward. Awful, silent grandeur reigned over all. What a contrast was this scene to the busy activity of Egypt. Here there was nothing to distract the mind, nothing to speak to the senses, but the stern granite pinnacles pointing toward heaven. God had commanded Moses to bring his people to this place of natural solitude and sol solemnity, sol sublimity, that they might hear his voice and receive the statute book of heaven. Fifty days previous to this, the pillar of fire had lighted the path through the Red Sea that God had miraculously opened before the marching multitudes of his people. They had since then made their way slowly onward through the desert, and God, by his miraculous power, had wrought for them in their necessity. <clears throat> when they were parched with thirst, they had murmured against God, forgetful of what he had done for them, but God did not forget them. He gave them water from the flinty rock and rained down bread from heaven to satisfy their hunger and through his providence taught them lessons of faith in his power. Now, <clears throat> as I read this and as I followed Miller's rules, 
I looked to try to bring all of the passages in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy together to try to understand what was being said here. What was key to me in reading through this, and this is because of the interaction that I've had with Stephen, we note this period that says 50 days previous to this, the pillar of fire had lighted the path through the Red Sea. Now, if you're reading this, how do you take it? Is this coming to the Mount, noting that 50 days before they're coming to the Mount, they had crossed through the Red Sea? What are your thoughts? Somebody said something. Okay. Okay, now I'm go ahead. I don't know. Okay. Now I'm going to shift to a different a different document. Where are you getting the 50 days from? 50 days previous to this, the pillar of fire had lighted. I, I see it now. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay. Do you see, so we have no question where I'm getting it. It's, it's Signs of the Times, 7th of March, 1878 in the second paragraph. Yeah, I got that. I just didn't see. I couldn't see the 50 days. Okay. Now. So what's your question again now, please? Okay. <clears throat> when you read this, would you understand that the, the 50 days previous to when they have come to Mount Horeb was the time in which they went through the Red Sea? It, it would seem to me that this is 50 days after they had went through the Red Sea. Okay, so we're on that on that point. Could we say that we are in agreement? Mm, yes. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a different document, <clears throat> and it's it's interesting as to how this can all work, and that's why we're gonna go through this test today because we're gonna examine several points. Okay, 1st of April, 1880. And no, I do not believe this was for Ellen White, April Fool's Day. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. The children of Israel had followed the directions given them of God. Now, while the angel of death was passing from house to house among the Egyptians, they were all ready for their journey and waiting for the rebellious king and his great men to bid them go. Could we agree that this is taking care of, this is taking place at the Passover? Yes. Okay. At midnight, there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So here we have a reference for the midnight cry, right? Yes. Yep. Now, I'm going to skip over a few paragraphs, and we're going to come to one paragraph for us to consider. Okay, here on paragraph nine. On the third day of their journey, the Hebrews encamped by the Red Sea, whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them, while on the south, a rugged mountain obstructed their further progress. Suddenly, they beheld in the distance the flashing armor, waving banners, and moving chariots of a great army. As they drew nearer, the hosts of Egypt 
were seen in full pursuit. Terror filled the hearts of Israel. Over all the encampment rose a tumultuous sound. Some cried unto the Lord, but far the greater part hastened to Moses with their complaints. So in this passage from the Spirit of Prophecy, on the third day of their journey, the Hebrews were encamped by the Red Sea, whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them. Now, the rest of this article continues to address the Red Sea crossing. Now, I find it interesting that the third day is brought up here, just as the 50th day was brought up in the previous document. Now, in the conversations that I have been having with other brothers, there's quite a question regarding whether or not the children of Israel had made it far enough by the literal third day to be able to cross the Red Sea, or if this crossing took a longer period. I am not willing to dispute the spirit of prophecy. However, there may be other manners in which the third day can be applied. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to look at some other examples. Now, in these studies that we've been doing over the last few weeks in the Minor Prophets, there is one word that comes to my mind as the overall theme in these studies. We have mentioned this word multiple times. What would that word be? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, question again? Over the last few weeks, in these studies on the minor prophets, there has been one word that I have mentioned many times as being the overall theme of these studies. What is that word? Covenant? Covenant, exactly. This test... I'm sorry, is, I, didn't, I didn't understand that word. Covenant? Okay, got it. Okay. Now, the test today is going to be how we define the covenant. Because as we were addressing last week, as we looked at different things that Mrs. Dwight had written, the situation that we have had is in preparing for the coming of Christ, the bride of Christ must make herself ready. The bride of Christ must choose to become ready for his coming before he can come. The bride must accept the covenant in all aspects. Do we have any problem with what I've just stated? Mm, not for me. Okay. All right. Now we're back to the Excel spreadsheet. I have a blank sheet with different forms on it because we're going to be addressing some very specific items. Now, in order for us to understand a covenant, I think it's gonna be easiest for us to consider a specific point in biblical time. Now, I have three specific selections here, and we're going to start, and I'm going to fill in some blanks, and I want to find out just how well 
everyone has understood these portions of the Bible. So if I, if I place this in this line and I write in the following, And I am looking for the anti-type, not the type. What period in the Bible am I considering? That's not a difficult question. Yeah, it's the time of Christ. Okay. So let's do this. Okay, so if I if I have put in the Passover, the unleavened bread and the first fruits, the Passover is going to occur when? The 14th. 14th day. First month. Of the first month. Unleavened bread is going to be? Well, it's the 15th to the 21st. Uh, and then first fruits, of course, would be? 16th. All of these in how we had our biblical dates but we would then also be able to take a look at them as either Julian dates or as we would put them on the calendar. So if I'm looking at this on the Passover, what day of the week would we call that? Well, it's Friday. Friday. Okay, so we would have, if I'm looking at this right here, okay. We would be six. Correct? Yeah. Okay, now. We are aware that Christ was crucified here on the sixth day, rested in the grave on the seventh, and he came from the grave on the first day. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any disagreement with those, do we? No. 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 Okay. Now, as we come down through here, what's the next major event? Pentecost. Okay. What's the next major event as far as the disciples are concerned? Well, that would be Jesus' transfiguration. Okay. Could we also call that or uh, I'm not transfiguration. Ascension, I meant. I, know, I, I kind of figured that. <laughs> okay, so when does the ascension occur? On the 40th day after it's on a sun. It's is it on a Sunday now? I'm trying to think how that works. It's it's going to be on a Sunday, isn't it? Nope. No, it's not. It's ten days before Pentecost, as Aaron right. said. Um. It's going to be on a Friday. Okay. Okay. 
So here we have Christ being taken back to heaven on the 40th day. Now we come down to here and we have Pentecost. What I'm trying to show of oh, the Sabbath. Okay. In this in this situation. As we come through all of this, we're looking at the first four feasts as God has ordained them. Mm -hmm. So we come through Passover, we come through the unleavened bread, we come through the first fruits. And then we are preparing for what we would, what we would see in the Bible. As... Feast of Weeks, and then we come to Pentecost. The 50th day. Right. Now, so I have I, I have some points that I, I would like you to consider, please. When do we begin numbering to the 50th day? From first fruits. Okay. So if we were to go all the way back here to the Passover, would we not have a period of 50 two days through to Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Where else in the Bible do we find a period of 52 days? Well, we find that in Nehemiah. It's the only place that it's called out. Mm -hmm. Now, what was being accomplished in 52 days in Nehemiah? Iran has it in his notes there, the chat. Are we building the wall or are we, I, I mean, is this the completion of the wall on the streets in troublous times? Mm -hmm. So what is happening here is we are seeing that we're seeing a type established. We are seeing in this 52 day period, something very important happen because what goes on with the disciples here on this 50th day, or as, as I'm trying to present the 52nd day, uh -huh. do they not receive the initial outpouring of the Holy spirit? Uh -huh. Yes. Is this not entering into a covenant with the disciples? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole idea of it. I would agree. Okay. Now... In this situation, the next portion that we're going to share, we're going to take this here. Hopefully this works the way I think it will. Yep, it did. And I'm going to share something with you that I know that Elder Jeff had, had shared 
but I don't know that many have really considered. Okay, now we're gonna go into the Millerite type. <clears throat> we're going to look for type to meet anti-type. Now, in the Millerite time, we know when the time of the end was to occur, right? 1798. Okay, now I'm gonna ask a question, brother. Do you have a date when the time of the end began to occur? I'm putting you right on the spot. I'd have to check my notes, bro. Okay. So let me let me put it up this way. It, it wasn't Passover, was it? No. Okay, I've just put a date onto this test. What is this date? Fifteenth uh, day of the second month. 15th day of February in 1798. Historically, what occurred here? When uh, Berthier marched into Rome and took the Pope captive. Okay. And it's the 46th day of the year. Okay. So let's, let's type this in. Okay, now does that make? Did you say 46th day of the year? Yeah, January 31, and then 15 more days. Yeah. Forty-sixth day of that particular year. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting observation. Mm -hmm. It's actually part of a structure. Um, to this so i never okay. realized i never realized that yeah no it prefigures the 46 years right yeah um that's very interesting okay now Pius the sixth is taken captive 15th of february of 1798 the next step. So it's interesting to me that he dies in captivity on the 29th of August of 1799. So he's taken captive on a Thursday. He dies on a Thursday. There's a total of 560 days from when he is taken captive until his death. Now, 80 weeks. Okay. Now we come here. Pius the seventh is now elected. March 14th of 1800. So in between all of these events, 757 days elapse. I don't know if that has any, any value to what our study has been or not. But we have identified here the time of the end. We have now identified a time period from the time of the end, the end of 
1,260 days of papal rule or 2,520 days of scattering. Now God begins to look to establish for his people. Now, as we look at this, as we consider this, we know that William Miller begins to study and begins to bring up biblical truths. Correct? Mm -hmm. Are you going to show us a mirror? I don't know that yet I'm going to show you the mirror, but I'm going to show you something kind of interesting. Hang on again for a second. And this is exactly why um, I'm manufacturing this symbols uh, Excel sheet. Okay. With all these different symbols, it's hard to keep track of them all. I mean, I'm good, but evidently not that good. Well, we're all in this together. We're all here to study. Now, what's being presented, I'm more than willing to consider that I could be incorrect in what I'm presenting. I'm presenting this before you because there is many things that we're going to have to be looking at. We're going to have to come into an understanding about. Now, when I was going uh, through, go, yes, Tom. Uh, what day of the week is the 14th of March? Is it another Thursday? It's actually the Friday. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, if this struck Sure holds as the other structure did, we're going to have some points that we're going to be looking at. Now, we are all aware <clears throat> of the great disappointment in 1844. But 1844 is not going to be part of this line. I would like you to consider something. Here we have, just as we showed with Christ, just as we had in the line of Christ, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. We have three events that have showed and determined clearly that this is now the close of the time of the end, and it is the beginning of God assembling his people. Now, if this is indeed the case, we should be able to identify something that is going to involve the following. So, bear with me for a moment. because I'm going to give you the end point and then we're going to work backwards. Here we have the 1850 chart. Why is the 1850 chart important? A covenant? Yes, it is. Why is it showing us the covenant? And, uh, okay, go on. Why is the 1850 chart showing us the covenant? Okay, well, brothers. 1850 chart. Okay. 
if we look at the 1850 chart, yeah. do we not identify the following? Is the Sabbath not being presented on the 1850 chart? Yeah, it is. Was the Sabbath presented on the 1843 chart? No. No. It was before they understood about the Sabbath. Okay, now I, I, I would like you to consider this. In July of 1849, so 49 years after Pius VII is elected, there were a series of conferences to address the Sabbath. God cannot enter into a covenant with a people that will not keep his entire law, that will not agree to his covenant. The 1843 chart was a start, but the 1843 chart did not establish the Sabbath. It did not show the solemnity of God's law. It just showed, it showed the foundation of the dates. Exactly. Wait. Now, in this situation, please consider that we are going from 1798 to 1850. How many years is that? 52. Do we not have now another, another symbol of 52 of building the walls? Because is the Sabbath not a wall, a hedge of protection for us? What date did you, just, what date did you start from again? I began from 15th of February, 1798. Okay. I've seen where this was going. Okay. This is an outstanding find. All of this is because of the work that Theodore and Stephen and Elder Jeff have done. All that's I mean, being can you right see here. the fingerprints here? I mean, oh, I see the fingerprints really? hugely. But this, this is just the easy part of it. We've got another one we're, that we're going to go into. We're going to go into quite deeply. Well, let's go. Well, we're not completed here yet. We have now established the 49. We've established the 50. What's missing on this chart? What's left blank? This is the part that smacked me right upside the head. And yeah, maybe I do have a brain bruise because of it. But you're looking at August 11th, 1840? Exactly, I am. Okay. So. Because that's 10 years before the 1850 chart. It's nine years before Sabbath was, was accepted. Yeah. So here we have a 40 and a 49. Okay. Just like the upper room experience. Bringing us to the Pentecost of 1850. Mm -hmm. Now, what was important about August 11th, 1840? That was the Ottoman. Okay. Now, does this chart, does this line line up with what we just went over regarding the week of Christ. Mm -hmm. Can we see in these symbols that 52, 49, and 50 are all important symbols 
for biblical history and for us to consider. Uh, I would say after getting hit in the face with the shovel, that yes. <laughs> I'm not trying to hit you in the face with a shovel. I've already been through that. Well, I know it's not you, bro. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. Now, what's really interesting, of course, is this ties right back in with Nehemiah, as Theodore was, pre was, was presenting. Because if we understand the situation with Nehemiah, then the situation with Ezra 10 becomes even more important for us. And if you're not familiar with Ezra 10, we're talking about a three-day period where the men of Judah and Benjamin are brought before the temple in a cold rain with the understanding that they are to give up their strange wives. That we are to give up the doctrines that are not part of God's law. Now, are there any questions with what we've just gone over here? Um, I just need a copy, please. You, you'll have a copy. And I, I assume you'd like the copy in Excel so you can really look it over. Yes, please. Easy. Okay. Um, do you have my email address? That would be negative. Okay. It's my name. Okay. Uh, Theodore has it. If you would ping him for me, that would be I'll, nice. I'll make sure it's done. Now, any, anybody that wants this in Excel rather than in PDF, just feel free to let us know, and then we'll make sure that this gets out. All right? Well, what is I'm thinking this is a good template. Bro. What's Excel? What is that? It's a spreadsheet program that, uh, that Microsoft offers, and there's several other different programs that you can use to be able to access this. Oh, okay. I'll just have mine on the, on the email then, PDF. Okay. All right. The, the situation, because I look at Excel as a, a three-dimensional calculator, I start looking at the pages where I can make notes. And I usually will make a lot of notes in my Excel spreadsheets. Okay, now that you've got an idea as to where this is going. Now we're going to touch on something that has really been, been just giving me fits over the last several weeks. Now, what we're going to be looking at is going to start in Exodus, but it's also going to be giving references in Numbers. Because what Moses did, he was very, very direct. He recorded events in Exodus, but he recorded details of their sojourn in Numbers 33. Now, let's address this because I would, I'd like to see what your thoughts are. So, as, we're, as we begin through this, actually, I'm going to take that out. Okay, as we're referring to this in Exodus, 14th day of the first month. That allows us to set the tone that this is going to occur with the Exodus itself, because this is the date of the Passover, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now I'm going to change this. We're going to go and we're going to begin this chart on the 15th day of the first month, which is the day that they're actually leaving, right? 
Yes. Right. Okay. Now, for reference here, we would have numbers 33, 3. We come up here, and we're going to leave Egypt. Now, What's important about this? What's important about noting the day that the unleavened bread feast ends? Well, we start to develop a pattern. We, we begin to develop a pattern is correct. But God ordained the feast of the unleavened bread. What's interesting, when, when you go through the Bible, when you go through the spirit of prophecy, you begin to realize that the children of Israel left with really the bare essentials they didn't take an oven with them they didn't take a way that they could cook with them they left with their kneading troughs bound up into their clothes yet they were told for seven days you are to eat unleavened bread you cannot eat unleavened bread when it's raw i mean i know a lot of people that like to try but at this point, we need to recognize that in this, the children of Israel left with the clothes on their backs and the items that they could take from the Egyptians with their herds and their flocks, and they were gone, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just left. Now, the two documents that I read from to begin with. One is stating that they crossed the Red Sea on the third day. And the other was stating 50 days previous. For the purpose of this study, we're going to discuss third day, which was the subject of the paper that I asked Theodore to send out. But we're going to use the premise of the 50th day in putting this line together. So I'd like you to consider the following. Okay. Now, we're going to look at Exodus 19. So, those that can, please open your Bibles to Exodus 19. We're going to be looking at beginning in verse 10 and going down through verse 25. You said 1912? I said 19, beginning in verse 10. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now, when we open this book, the first 
verse that jumps out is Exodus 19.1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. The question that has been presented and the logic that has been addressed is that in order for them to have done this, in the third day, on the self-same day, that this very likely would have been the day in which they left Egypt, which would be the 15th day of the third month. So if we take this in the biblical year that we're dealing with, this would have meant that they would have come before Horeb on the 15th day of Sivan, which would have been a Sunday. This is when, when we would find that this situation would be addressed with the children of Israel. So, as we look at this, could I have someone please read Exodus 19, verse 10? And the Lord, and the Lord, please go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Okay, now at this point, we're dealing with Moses being given an instruction. So Exodus 19 verse 10 is given after Moses has been in the mount. He has come before God and he has given an instruction to the people. But the instruction of the pe to the people is for them to be sanctified and to do what? Wash their clothes. Is this an instruction that God would have given for them to have done on the Sabbath? No. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to present this in this manner. Here is the first day where they will be washing their clothes, right? Right. Couldn't hear you, sorry. Now, If we look at the next verse, Exodus 19, 15, what is the instruction that God gives to Moses? Can someone please read that? And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Come not at your waves. Okay. So. Does it mean at your wives? No, not at your wives. I would say that what's being addressed here is 
you are not to have any marital relations at this point. You are to respect God while the marriage covenant is yet a covenant. The covenant with God takes more critical need. You are to honor God first. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, take precedence, right. Okay. So on this, we are addressing points. So here we have the Sabbath, where we are being told that God is presenting a covenant. Here we come down, and what happens on the third day? We have the covenant presented. Now, all of these verses bring us to these points. Here we have the Red Sea crossing. And this shows us day one. The seventh day here brings us to day 49. Here we have day 50. And we have 51, and we have 52. Here we have the mirror. We have the chiastic structure presenting before us that God has observed within his people a people that he wishes to raise up as a peculiar people, priests to the world in all of the children of Israel. But as we've learned from the study of Malachi, what happened? The covenant was set aside by all of the children of Israel. Only the tribe of Levi held to the covenant. Now, as we were just looking at this and we were giving reference to Nehemiah, as we were giving reference to the week of Christ, as we were giving reference to the Millerites, we've now established another line of 52 days. And on the 52nd day from the Red Sea crossing, we have a covenant being presented. Do you have any thoughts of, with this? Do you have any comments? I will say that, um, that God has an interesting way of pointing things out. <clears throat> and he points them out when we need to see them um, without saying did you say 52nd day from when they left egypt i'm saying the 52nd day from the red sea crossing and then that gives us the answer to the 50 and the three in the two documents <clears throat> it gives us quite quite a pattern to consider looks like another template because now now what we're talking about is god is presenting a covenant so my question for your consideration
do we see these three days of preparation leading up to the information and the, the presentations that we've been that we have been given involving July 18th and December 25th, 2021. Is God giving us the pattern to recognize that there are those that are now choosing to follow his covenant and being prepared to become the priests and the Levites to give this final message to the world? For me, this has been a very sobering thought. Is there, an, is there any way that we can bring this line into our movement? I think that's going to be part of what we're going to be studying over the next several weeks. We need to be able to recognize symbols. We need to be able to use Miller's rules to be able to understand what has been presented before so that we can then clearly see what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Because part of the thing that we notice is that God has given us light but it's not the complete light yet. That is what he's established is correct. But we, we continue to misinterpret because everything isn't clear yet. And it's only as we walk along the path that we get light for our feet. There's a lot in the document that I'd ask Theodore to send out. It did, I, did I send it out? I think you did. Okay, okay. When did, you, when did you send it? I would have sent it with uh, the, the meeting schedule. Well, what was the title of it? Three days. Yes, yeah. it's here. I have it. Uh, it's open. Okay. Now, there's quite a bit more than just three days on here. What there is is a definition from Cruden's Concordance about day and how Cruden saw this. Then we, I took all of the verses that had anything to do with the three days, listed them, and then continued on so that you would see other pertinent information throughout. This document, we're going to be looking at this next week. I'm going to ask each that are involved in this meeting and those that look at these on the internet later to carefully consider what is here from Cruden's because we're going to look to go over this as Father Miller would have looked at it. We have to come to an understanding of what the day means, what three days mean, and what their symbol is, what the 49th and the 50th days are, and what the 40th day has to do in all of these situations. This movement is being led. When Jeff first presented the situation regarding the Millerite time, it was almost 10 years ago. 
but many did not catch on to what he was saying at that time. I vaguely, vaguely remember that. Well, the time that I heard him give these presentations was when he was brought to Newport. The Adventist churches would not allow him to speak in an Adventist church and a Baptist church was rented. And what's really wild to me is so many of the people that were involved in that meeting that were so on fire at that time for what was happening in Newport, Washington, have now chosen that this has been the wrong path. They have stepped off and they have nothing further to say, nothing further to offer regarding this message. That is I mean, the real tragedy. Do you remember the, uh, the sermon name tragedy in Newport? Yeah, I do. Very well. That was a very interesting one. I ran into copies of what Jeff had presented here that I had, I had saved on an external hard drive. And I've gone back over this to try to understand it further. And the more I, that I've been led to look at what he presented then has led to these lines being drawn out. We have a lot to consider. We have a lot that I don't think that we've seen yet. You said the people in Newport rejected this, rejected that particular study. They didn't, they didn't even understand it. Oh, okay. I know of I know of several parties that were at that meeting. I can identify them well from the video that was taken, and I know exactly who created the video. The person that created the video, the, per, the, the couple that brought Jeff to Newport at that time, along with several others, are right now questioning whether you know, this was a legitimate leading of God. And it, makes, you know, it, it just makes me wonder. It, makes, it, it, it shocks me. It is shocking. Now, I would suggest to you that that's part of the sifting process. I agree. But from what we from what we put through on these lines so far, do you have any questions at this point regarding what we're what we've been addressing? Not at this time, but we need to individually look over it. Okay. More fully. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll back down through here just so you can see some of the more completed items that I have. So here in Exodus, on the fifth day of the biblical year 2513, which was the 15th day of the first month, the children of Israel leave Egypt. As we would see it, that was April 26th, the 1533 BC, which was a Thursday. The Feast of Unleavened Bread would have completed the following Wednesday. The reason for this portion to have been included. When we're dealing with the third day. The week following. Was the completion of Unleavened Bread. If if we were looking at the literal third day that the children of Israel were to leave from the leaving of Egypt for Pharaoh to have come at them, that would have meant counting ordinarily that Pharaoh would have come after the children of Israel on the Sabbath. That they would have had to have moved very quickly 
in three days to be able to cross the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's at least 150 kilometers. And 150, uh, 150 kilometers is how many miles? Well, that's <laughs> American adult brains. Uh, 90 miles. Is that right? No. Uh, hang on. That's not right. Right. Um, 150. Yeah, that's 90 miles. So walk three days takes to walk 90 miles. About 90 miles. Now, Mrs. White is very clear that there was more than a million people mm -hmm. that had made this journey. Now, they went out harnessed, which means that they were organized like a military army. If we if we look at the alternate reading of harnessed, mm -hmm. I believe you'll find that means five by five. Okay. Now, you have people, you have flocks, you have herds. Doing 90 miles in three days would mean that they would need to be able to do 30 miles a day. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible for a million people to walk 30 miles a day? Not under norm normal circumstances. Okay. God probably gave them the strengths. <laughs> Well, God definitely gave them the strength because their feet did not swell. And that's a quote from scripture. And their sandals didn't wear down. Yeah. Yeah, their so, sandals. Go ahead. I can tell you that um, people can ride a bicycle at about 12 miles an hour. And it takes about 55 minutes or so to move that 12 miles or an hour to move that 12 miles. Okay. Uh, people walk at about a three mile an hour pace. One, well, I do. I walk at almost a five mile an hour pace. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm only 63 years old. And if I had the entire Egyptian army that I was worried about, I think I could make that almost seven miles an hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For an extended length of time. Yeah, well, this would be 10 hours a day of walking at three miles an hour. Uh, so that's, what, 30 miles? Yeah, yeah, it's 30 miles, so a day, 10 hours a day of actual walking. So logically, that works out. And if you're motivated by fear or... Um... Yeah, well, well, the problem would be flocks and things like that that don't move that fast. And also... Uh, you'd have to be extremely organized to get everybody to move at once and then to set up camp at once. Because normally, if you just had a random group of people, they could not move uh, at that that pace. Plus, you have to you have to consider uh, the number of people um, if they all moved at the same time. But if you have a group of people start to move, the latter part of the group of people, if you think about a million people, it's a huge number of people. For instance, uh, I know this isn't part of the study, but uh, a lot of people try to say that they crossed at the Gulf of Aquaba, which is a lot farther. You're looking at at least three times the distance, if not four times the distance, which you couldn't possibly do in three days. But you also have to go through a mountainous region with a narrow pass about 10 feet long to get onto uh, the Nuaba Beach which is what you know people like um um can't think of his name it's on the tip of my tongue wyatt why Wyatt. yeah why i remember him i'll use that it's going to be uh that they're going to cross on the nuba beach that they're going to cross the gulf of aquaba but to get on the nuba nuba beach if you had a million people it would take three weeks to walk through the opening uh at three miles an hour for people to get onto the beach itself. Um, now, 
if you take that this three days is correct, the rest of the journey to Mount Sinai, the correct one, not the one that Ron Wyatt has, um, you would have, of course, another, you know, 50 days to get there, which is about twice the distance. It's about another 300 kilometers. Now, the thing is they have to get to Mount Sinai itself, and there is a narrow pass that goes into Mount Sinai that opens into this wide plain that Ellen White's talking about that surrounds the mountain. Um, and, and this would be why you would need that extra time at the end of the journey to go into this, this uh, plain that's in the midst of the mountains, which she talks about. So, um, so the logistics there work, but you realize you have to have pretty much a miracle to get to Suez for a million people in three days, but it is possible. Uh, miracles is his business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're dealing not only with the 600,000 men that are recorded in scripture, mm -hmm. we're dealing with their wives, we're dealing with their children, but we're dealing with an age of people that easily can go from the the adult age of let's say 30 and 40 easily up to 80 to 100 mm -hmm. yeah so they have to be highly motivated to get there in three days which could happen uh the other thing is so Stephen had 10 days to get to the red sea right uh, now his was uh the fact that it's three days that still work it would have to move his sabbath that that uh, moses um it, that ellen white refers to where moses says on the mount before the 40 days right um it just has to move it one week earlier and i had had two weeks to the red sea which was based upon the logistics of, of the herds and herding them it would take about two weeks to get to the suez um normally so you would have to have uh, the problem isn't the people the problem is mostly the animals and unless they're not taking any lambs and they're just taking full full grown uh sheep and goats etc uh, it, it I, I, this i'm grasping at straws but is it possible that the red sea was uh fuller than it is today oh yeah well the yeah so the 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 gulf is extended further north than it does today yeah it would seem logical um in a scientific manner if we want to look at the past to the to the today's date yeah the thing is you have the mountains though down in the area which is that what is the north tip of the suez because they're trapped between the mountains and the suez plus also they've already crossed into the wilderness of etham and have to backtrack so, so they're on the edge of the wilderness of Ethan, which is on the other side of the Red Sea. So they, they're actually on the other side of the Red Sea when they backtrack and, and end up on the west side of the Red Sea and then have to cross back again. Um, so I know it's, there's a lot of logistics there, but it, it, I don't mean to detract from Dwight's study. It's just that, um, you know, this is something that we still have to work out. We, I've had a view Stephen had a view, and now Dwight has a view, and his is possible, and it's based upon the spirit of prophecy. Well, the, the point, and this, this is the, the thing that I find most intriguing, mm -hmm. is that if, in, in these views, in, in making this presentation on the Exodus, if you combine both of the situations on the spirit of prophecy as you were just addressing mm -hmm. it would mean that the third day would mean that the children of israel would have had to cross the red sea on a sabbath right um yeah which okay. I, don't, I don't have a problem with i'm not i'm not saying that there is a problem but what, I, what I'm looking at in, in this detail 
it's either that they crossed on a Sabbath or just after a Sabbath. The point being that they, they're going to travel on a Sabbath. Okay. But no, no. My, my point being that they come to the covenant, either they're given the covenant the 52nd day at Sinai. They're given that either on the 70th day of the biblical year, or they're given it on the 77th day of the biblical year. Yeah, so there's still things we have to work out. Yes, there are. Yeah. So I was intrigued by a lot of this. Now, I have not done all of the work on Nehemiah, but there's quite a bit there that, that just gives us reference on the 52nd day of the walls being completed. Now, I was intrigued with this in the week of Christ. Because as we lay this out, Passover would have been on the 27th of April of 31 AD. And this, mm -hmm. this is one of the points that I really do like about the way in which, in, in which the calendar converter works. So we would have the 27th, 28th, and 29th of April in 31 AD. Mm -hmm that Christ ascended on the 8th of June of 31 AD. And then we come down here where the 49 days completes on the 16th of June and that the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost is on the 17th of June of 41 or 31 AD but it gives us a, a good time to understand of this time period of the upper room. Just as we were dealing with this in the Millerite time frame, from 1840 to 1849, the Millerites had to come to an understanding of what the law of God was really representing. In this time period with the disciples, in that 49 days, they spent it in prayer, confessing of sins, and they were coming into unity. This is the challenge that is before us as a movement today. Is for us to be able to come into a unity so that the spirit of God can be poured out. If we're not willing to go through this upper room experience, we cannot expect to see the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, you made a comment about the confessions of sins, and it has a totally different perspective to me now that uh, the way you mentioned it and the way that it was being used in the upper room experience. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just, whenever I see here that, I, all I can think of is, oh yeah, well, I stole a pack of turkey from wherever, you know. Sure. But now I see it as uh, the sense of, of, especially the way uh, the messenger um, puts certain things is that, um, the sin is is the lack of knowledge or the lack of understanding, uh, uh, choosing to have that uh, lack of understanding, being the sin that is. Passing your sins to me, again, is uh, sure uh, the things that I had just held, like just that right there, uh, my understanding of it, as opposed to how you had mentioned it and the way I see it. Okay. Let's see. Now, if we, if we come back down here to this in the Millerite time frame, here we have the Bible that was confirmed where the Ottoman Empire fell. 
And by July of 1849, they're having the Sabbath conferences because they're seeing a truth that had not been recognized before in the Bible. The situation that we have right now, throughout the time with this with the church, is the law has been preached. It's been preached, as Mrs. White would say, until it was as dry as the hills of Gilboa. The law does not mean anything, even within the Seventh-day Adventist church today. If we look directly at what Mrs. White has written, we have a covenant that was presented before the people. We have the testimony of God's character that is given to us in Exodus 20. We have the ordinances of how we are to treat our brothers and sisters in Exodus 21, 22, and 23. All of this was presented before the children of Israel. All of this was provided for them to understand what they were to do and how they were to do it. Yet, it was not long after the covenant was presented to them that they chose to accept idolatry rather than the worship of the true God. Of the ordinances that were given in Exodus 21, 22, and 23, how many of those ordinances are we as a people choosing to practice today. As we study for ourselves in this next week, as we prepare for what we're going to delve into this next Sabbath, Consider carefully these ordinances. Look to see if, if you individually are accepting these ordinances and are practicing these ordinances as God gave them to the children of Israel. If you are, wonderful. If you oh, find, really? What do you mean by ordinances? When you read Exodus 21, 22, and 23, these are points that were brought to the children of Israel because as former slaves, they didn't understand how to treat each other. Oh, okay. All right. I see what you're saying. Okay. I thought, yeah, yeah, I thought you meant something else. No. <laughs> Okay, I got it. <laughs> so, as, as former adherents in a system that has accepted the wine of Babylon, how many of these ordinances do we understand for ourselves today? The Ten Commandments are the testimony of God's character. The ordinances explain what we are supposed to be able to understand. We are as much as the world will be under a three-step testing message. But our three steps are justification, sanctification, and judgment. 
for how can we be glorified if we are not willing to submit to being examined to whether or not we are willing to take his covenant and live by that covenant. Malachi was very clear. This is the covenant that is presented to the priests. This is the covenant that is presented to us today. Now, there's a lot, yes, we have yet to consider. The morning studies that Theodore has been presenting flesh out the little bit that, that's been presented today. And they're doing a much better job than I'm able to do at this point. All of this is based upon work that others have done. This is just a reiteration. This is for us to consider and for us to determine, are we willing to live according to what God has stated here or are we gonna set it aside? Joshua was very clear. When he was coming to the end of his time as leader, he stated, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How say you today? There's a series of articles that Mrs. White wrote. <clears throat> I find it very interesting. We touched on one of those articles last week. There was a sister that, that sent me some of this back and asked questions about how pointed these articles were. Of that series, there's a series of 10 articles overall, all dealing with one subject sanctification. As we have been studying over the last several weeks, I think it becomes clearer and clearer that sanctification can be lined up with the message of the second angel. If we have not accepted the message of the first angel to fear God, we cannot be truly justified. If we have not accepted the message of the second angel to give glory to him, then how can we accept that the hour of his judgment has come? If we will not accept those three, how are we able to worship him? These are the challenges before us today. The movement is no different than the world. It's just that the movement gets the opportunity to come to an understanding of what the covenant really is so that it can be explained to all of those with whom we come in contact to give this final message. That's why all of this, especially on covenant, has become so critical 
as these lines were being put together. Do you have any, any comments, any thoughts? It's time for me. I'd like to make an observation. Okay. Um, this really doesn't have too much to do with what we're studying right now, but uh, I've been going over a lot of the videos. And one of the things that I've noticed is, is an uptick in views. Um, for the longest time, it was only a few people that were viewing these videos. Uh, since they are yours, Theodore, is it a possibility that you have the stats on that? On, on which videos specifically? Yeah, so what I'm just wondering if, is, you know, are you noticing an uptick? Um, well, it's hard to say because people are behind. So people are still watching older videos. So older videos generally have more views. Um, but, you know, so it, it's pretty yeah. consistent, but we've got about 100 views for for vid for a video after a period of time yeah i i've noticed that like on number 12 uh it's got like 40 some views now and normally it stays at like 11 or 12 um for a while yeah 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 there's lots of views people are studying these things yes um we don't see it but there there is evidence of it yeah. Well, I see it. <laughs> because, exactly. Uh, you have a different perspective because uh, you have those style files and stats. Yeah. Plus, I also have, you know, who's reading my papers on academia and where and, uh, you know, what papers they're reading and how many pages. And so there's definitely lots of interest in what's happening. Yeah, I'm beginning to start picking up on that. Okay, any other comments? No, just when are you gonna mail us the Excel sheet? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get them out today. Okay. Thank we you. Have, we have about 20 minutes before the, uh, the next session is going to start. So we'll take a bit of a break, but shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we examine your word and the words of your prophets, we find that there are indeed many examples, many in samples that you have provided for our admonition, for our growth, and for our understanding. Be with us, Father, through this day. Help us so that we may be attentive hearers of your word. And as attentive hearers, that we may be attentive doers of your word as well. Direct us now. Please guide us. Show us that that you would have us to understand. So that we may grow in the grace that you have offered and be prepared to give the message that you would give at this time. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.